Next Level You is what this series is called. And what we're doing is we're working on moving to the next level in every area of our lives. And we've been looking at how Jesus spoke to his disciples at the, toward the end of his earthly ministry and, and he, and he shared some things with his disciples in, in a few different episodes, but, uh, it, it, we, we're, we're kind of looking at how did he, how did he speak to them in a way to reveal like his parting thoughts. Like, do you ever, do you ever have that moment, like you're getting ready to walk out of the house, you're getting ready to leave, uh, where you are, and you want to make sure that, you know, everybody's got what, you know, you, they, they, that there's something important and you don't want, uh, them to miss it, and so you, you kind of stop and you just sort of rehearse the, the, the key, the key points, you know? I, I think that's part of what Jesus did at the end of his ministry when he spoke to his disciples, is, is he kind of caught the essence of, uh, of a few things that that are um, that are very important that he wants us to hold on to that he wants us to latch on to and 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 keep a hold of and, and so in Luke chapter twenty four verse thirty six uh, starting in verse thirty six I'm gonna I'm gonna start there by the way if you are if you are a U version user you can go on the U version Bible app and. We have our sermon notes and all of that on there. You just go on the app and click on more and then click on events and it will be right at the top of the page if you have your GPS thing set up, turned on because it knows where you are. Big brother's watching. So anyway, just in case you want to follow along on your app, you are, you, you can do so because we are in the 21st century here and, um, We've hooked it up. By the way, Paul Paul hooked it up for us. Paul is in the house this morning. Yeah, you you all you all get to benefit from a lot of Paul's work, but you don't get to see him very often. So the elusive creature has emerged from the depths of his lair, and uh, we're we're glad glad to have him here with us uh, today. He's usually serving over at our Lancaster campus uh, on the worship team and. And, uh, the tech team and making things happen and, and all of that. You know, we, we have a lot of people around here. We have a great team that makes things happen, that, that pulls things together. And it's like magic, right? It's an amazing thing. We've added a member to our team, to our, uh, staff this past, this past week. We added Kevin Kershatono, something like that. Um, the guitar player, the good looking kid here that's, the, you know, does the thing. The, the, he, uh, he's an amazing guy and, and we had an opportunity to, uh, to had, add him to our team this week. So we, we want to welcome him. Uh, he brings a lot to the team and one of the things that he's going to bring to take us to the next level is he's going to be leading worship on Sunday nights for Elevate. Yeah, so we're, we're excited about that. They already have a great team that, that, uh, is, is leading there, but Kevin is going to make a, a great contribution to that as well as all the other magic he can do. So we're thankful for that. Back to Luke 24. Luke 24 is one of those moments where Jesus speaks to his disciples and we get to listen in. We get to eavesdrop a little bit. And he says these words. He, he says, while they were still Talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And the first week of the series, we talked about how to up-level our peace, how to up-level our peace with God and peace with others and how to experience the peace that God has for us. And then he says in verse 37, they were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. And we talked about how to up-level our courage. And how to step out. And when we see God moving, not to be afraid of it, but to step into it and be a part of it. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? And we talked about up-leveling our faith and how to increase our faith so that we can move into the things that God wants us to move into and be able to trust and believe in Him. And it, and, and it goes on to say, in verse 40, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they were still, 
While they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Do you have anything to eat? That's kind of the key verse that we're going to, the key thought, if you will, that we're going to look at there. Do you have anything to eat? In other words, do you have anything of value to add? Are you bringing something to the table? What do you have to put on the table? What do you have to add to the people around you? Do you have anything to eat? It's a, it's a, it's a very important question. So the, the title today is up level your value to others. How do we up level our value to others? And how are we going to make a difference? In other words, how are we going to bring more to the table? The point that I want to get to today is this. Your ability to up-level your value to others is dependent on your correct understanding of why God has you where you are with what you have. Where you are with what you have. Understand this. God has you where you are with what you have for a reason. You're not here by accident. The Scriptures say very clearly in in the book of Acts, it says that you are where you are when you are on purpose. That you are here for this time. In the book of Esther, uh, he spoke to to Esther and said, maybe it's for such a time as this that you are here. That your purpose is is right here, right now, with what you have. And the more we understand that, the more we embrace that, and the more we step into that, the more value we're going to be able to bring to the people around us. And so uh, today, I'm going to I want to talk to you about a few things. You all know that one of my heroes is is John Maxwell. And John Maxwell, if you're talking about adding value to people, um, then he is the man. He's he's kind of the the grandfather of it all. Uh, in explaining that, but in his book called Intentional Living, he, he breaks down five, five things, five values that we must have to add value to others. Five values that needs to be in us so that we can add values to others. Number one is to add value to others, I must first value myself. I need to understand that I have value in me, that I am made in the image of God, that I am here on purpose, that I am here with what I have on purpose, because God has put me here to do what He has in store, what He has planned out, right? The Scripture says that that you are here because He wants you to uh, to fulfill His purpose, to fulfill His plan, that He works everything out in conformity to accomplish His will, and guess what He does it with? You and me, people, us. We are the tools that God uses to affect change, to make things happen, to save, to build, to create, to make whatever is on earth. We are the ones that are used by God to do it. And it's and it's in accomplishing that or it's in stepping to, into that and owning that that we get to experience the purpose that we're here. He writes in the book that the, the only way we can be consistent and authentic in valuing others is to see value in ourselves. The only way that you are really going to be consistent and authentic in valuing other people is when you value yourself. He, he has a, a thing called the, the law of the lens, and it, and it says that you don't see people as they are, you see people as you are. Whatever you're thinking about you is what you're going to think about others. So you need to up-level how you think about you. You need to up-level the value that you have for yourself. Because the way that you value yourself is the way that you're going to value others. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about that, and I'm not going to go through all the verses, but just kind of off the top of my head, there's a, there's a few that pop out. You are not your own. You were bought at a price, right? Do, do you understand that something is of value only based on what someone else will give for it, right? Right? There, there was a, there was a, here, here's a little rubber band, right? 
How much can you give me for this? God, get a five, 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 five. No, I'm not a very good auctioneer. But if, if I were going to auction this off, right, how much would you give for it? How much would you? Anybody? Anybody? Bobby T., how much would you give for it? S- say the answer, Bobby T. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> say nothing. That's the answer, right? Why? Because this is of no value to Bobby T, right? This the, why would he buy this? That makes no right? Nothing. It has no value to him. Now, Maddie, if she really wanted a ponytail, this, uh, let me just put it, some girl somewhere, maybe in this room, paid money for this, or at least your parents did, right? Somewhere, somebody paid something for this. It ended up in the floor, and I picked it up, <laughs> right? But somewhere, somewhere along the line, somebody looked at this little black rubber band thing, and they said, that's worth something to me. And what they pulled out of their pocket and paid for it is the value that it's worth, right? Now, what if Walmart were to put this on a shelf all by itself and put a price tag for, say, $100? It's probably going to stay on the shelf for a long, long time, right? Yeah. Why? Because something is only of as much value as you will pay for it. You were bought at a price, and that price was Jesus Christ's life. The Son of God gave His life so that you could live. You were bought, you were purchased at a price. Therefore, you are of value. Incredible value. Unfathomable value. That's how much you're worth. That's how much you matter to God. That's how much God was willing to pay for you. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That God gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would be able to live eternally. That is value. And so when we understand our value in the eyes of God, it changes everything. When, when an art gallery sets up their, their art, you know, they bring people in, they bring es- experts in that know art, that have that, you know, the understanding of it, and they come in and they look at the art and they value it. They say, yeah, that painting is worth X, and this painting is worth this much, and this painting is worth that much. Why are they doing it? It's all just canvas and paint. It's all in how it's arranged. That makes the difference. You are arranged perfectly for such a time as this, for this moment, with what you have. You are who you are with what you have when you are here for a purpose. You are arranged perfectly to be invaluable in the kingdom of God. When you understand that, when you embrace that, when you recognize that, now you will begin to look at others in a completely different way. Because until you value you, you can't value others. Until you understand what you are worth to God, you will not understand what they are worth to Him either. And so it's understanding that that changes everything and changes the way that we look at things Brian Tracy is, is quoted here. It says, that there, is a, there, there is a different relationship between your own level of esteem. I'm sorry. There is a direct relationship between your own level of self-esteem and the health of your personality. The more you like and respect yourself, the more you like and respect other people. The more you consider yourself to be a valuable and worthwhile person, the more you consider others to be valuable and worthwhile as well. The more you accept yourself just as you are, the more you accept others just as they are. The way that that thought has lived out in my life is a deeper understanding of grace. A deeper understanding of the grace of God 
and the grace that He has put into my life and the grace that He has had to use to be able to bring me into a relationship with Him causes me to understand that grace is the greatest gift I could ever give to anyone else. Because who am I to judge? Who am I to, who am I to look down upon anyone? You know, I, I came in and spoke to uh, the, the teenagers last night and to the, to the Elevate students last night that were here for the boot camp. And, and, I, and I started, when I was preparing for it, I, I, I was thinking about, you know what, maybe I should, maybe I should go back and, and tell them some of the stories of things that I did when I was a teenager. And then I thought better of that, and I went with Moses. I just, I, I'm not going to do But as I thought about that, I just began to think, man, the grace that God has had to demonstrate for me to be able to stand before you and speak for Him is just unfathomable. It's just insane that God would have that much grace for me. And it's there that I began to see the value of other people we look at other people and say oh but you know well look at what they're doing they're you know doing this and they're running there and they're doing that and they think this way and they do that thing and they dress that way and they act this way blah 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 and and all the while i did all of that and more and god still had grace for me because of the value that he put on me You see, my value is not based on me. My value is based on what He was willing to pay for me. That's what uplevels your value. Number two is to add value to others, I must value others. I have to value others to be able to uplevel, to add value. I have to value you. I have to care. Mother Teresa said this, one of the greatest diseases is to be nobody to anybody. Think about that. If you are nobody to anybody, you have no value. One of the, one of the saddest things that I do uh, as, as a pastor is, is go into nursing homes. That has got to be the saddest place on earth. <laughs> I, I really, I really don't enjoy going there. Because as I walk down the hall of nursing homes, I, I, I see people sitting in their rooms alone. And I wonder, does anybody care that this person is here? Does anybody know that this person is here? And you can just feel loneliness in the air. In a nursing home, it is it is it is one of the most uncomfortable places on the planet to me, and I think it's that it's because of that. It's the loneliness in the air. To be nobody to anybody is a terrible way to exist. You know what? Here's the great thing about that, though: you can change that for somebody. You can change that for somebody. When you begin to reach out to somebody who is nobody to anybody, you make them somebody. Right? I'm not saying that again. So, let's move on. Hopefully that got recorded. Okay, number three. Number three. To add value to others, I must value what others have done for me. I must be grateful for what others have done for me. I I told a story last night to the students. When I first went in the army, I was not a good student. I slept through history class. I didn't care about all that's all in the past. That's done. Why do I need to know that? You know, right? I'm out. Then I got in the army and I put on a uniform and I started to realize, wait a minute, (laughs) this uniform represents somebody. This represents something. 
This represents something that people were willing to die for, that people were willing to give their lives for. And, and I began to think about that, and I, and I, and I began to get, ex, get interested in that and start to read about the soldiers, the, the people who have gone before me and, and the sacrifice that they have made and the things that they have done so that I, as this 19-year-old punk little kid, can go and put on this uniform and stand up and represent my, my nation, my country. This is a gift that has been given to me by hundreds, thousands of men and women throughout the ages so that I get to wear the uniform now. I, I think that about the church, that I am clothed in Christ, and the reason that I get to put on that is because of what has been given for me. When I live with that kind of gratitude, it's humbling. And it causes, it causes me to value the, the people around me, the men and the women around me, the, the, the people who have gone before. I think about, I think about Gary and Rich and, and these guys that, that I've, I've been blessed with being able to be with for my whole ministry. The whole time we've been here at this church, these guys were here and they planted, they, they paved the way, they made the way by building a building, by putting together a congregation, by bringing and serving day after day after day and doing what it took so that we could grow into what we are today. These guys paved the way. And without them, I couldn't do what I do. We couldn't be here. We couldn't be experiencing what we do because somebody went before you. And it's recognizing that and it's celebrating that that changes everything. You have to count your blessings if you want to be a blessing. If you want to be a blessing to others, you have to remember your own blessings that have been given. Number four says, to add value to others, I must know and relate to what others value. I need to know people. I need to value people and I need to get to know them. One of the things that, that, that I learned a while back and it's just changed the way I think is, is once you learn someone's story, you can't help but love them. You don't have to agree with them. You, you don't have to completely understand all about them. But once you learn their story, once you actually take enough time to sit down with somebody and ask them some questions, make yourself available and ask them some questions and learn their story and get into their lives and understand why they, what, what they've gone through and what they've experienced and where they are, that will cause a love to rise up in your heart for that person. Because you know, where, you know what causes prejudice? What causes us to be prejudiced against others is fear. Do you know what takes away fear? I know you want to say faith. You're right. But there's something else. Familiarity. The more familiar you become with someone, the more you understand we are one big family. Right? I, I love, I think it's, I think it's Italian. I could be wrong. Don't beat up on me or anything, but I think in Italian, you, you say family, familia, right? Something along that line, somewhere around there. Spanish, I think Italian too, maybe, uh, wherever, somebody somewhere on the planet <laughs> says it that way. Familia, mia familia, right? I am familiar with my familia. It's that idea that brings us together, that helps us understand there's a lot more. There is way more that we have in common than we have different from one another. Right? If we could just understand that and embrace that. I, I, I have some news for you too. You know, you, you might as well go ahead and get used to being around people that are different than, than you because we're all going to the same heaven. And we're all going to be hanging out together for eternity. It's going to be a long time, right? So you might as well just go ahead and drop any differences that get on that, that bother you and, and, and just go ahead and embrace, right? Number five, to add value to others, I must make myself more valuable. The more valuable I become, the more I have to offer the more I have to offer, right? 
So the more I invest in myself, the more I, I, I get better at what I do and I uplevel my gifts that God has given me and, and I embrace them and I step into them, the more I get to experience bringing value to others. So here's, now that was Maxwell's five. These are my five. These don't belong to Maxwell, though I probably learned them from him. These are seven. I got set. He just had five. I got seven. All right, anyway. Seven ways you know you're adding value to others. Number one, you're adding value when you set an example for others to follow by choosing character and integrity. When you choose character and integrity over doing it the easy way, over taking the short road, over, over taking a shortcut and, and not, uh, and, and taking advantage of people or doing things that you know are not integrous, right? <laughs> When you choose character and integrity, it puts you in a position where you get to make a difference, where you can matter. Listen, listen to what Paul says to Timothy. When Timothy was a very young man, and he's preparing for the ministry, he's preparing to be a pastor, and, and Paul is mentoring him, and he's teaching him, and he says these words to him, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, how does he tell Timothy not to let people look down on him? You don't, you, you cause people to not look down on you when you live a life worth looking up to. Right? We ought to write that down. I just thought of that. When you live a life worth looking up to, it causes, it causes you to gain credibility with people that will ultimately position you to be able to add value into their lives. The only people that really bring and add value into your life are people that have credibility with you. If they have no credibility, you don't listen to them. You ignore them. As a matter of fact, what they say gets on your nerves, right? They might even say good stuff and it still gets on your nerves. Somebody else could say the exact same thing that has credibility with you and you're like, oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. I love that. I'm going to change my whole life because of that. But that guy over there said it who has no credibility with me and I didn't even hear it. Because credibility comes from character and integrity and living a life that is worth following and worth looking up to. Number two, I'm sorry, another verse under this one. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Paul said that, and when I read it, and when I was thinking about this, I thought, you know what? It takes a lot of guts to say that. I mean, it's not like a pompous, you know, an, an egotistical kind of thing. Not at all. I, I think it's a very humbling thing. Because what is Paul saying? He's saying, listen, I am going to endeavor to live a life before you that is worthy of you following and modeling. That's a life that will matter. All right, number two, you're adding value when people are seeking you out because they need a solution to a problem. When we have something to add, when we have something to bring, something to make a difference, something to put on the table, people seek you out, right? When, when you're hungry, where do you go? You go to restaurants and you go to, you know, food courts and, and you go, you go where the people that are there have what you are looking for because they have something to put on the table before you. And, and when we understand that and we recognize that we get to add value to the people who are seeking us out, you got to pay attention. Why are people seeking you out? What are pe what questions are people asking you? That's a good indication of what, what of what you're gifted at, 
right? It's a good indication of what God has put into you because listen to me, you might not see it, but what God has put in you, other people will see it. And they will ask you questions about it. And they will seek you out when they have a problem in that area. Proverbs 22, 29 says, Do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. They will serve before kings. When you are skilled in what you do, when you have honed your craft, when you have honed the, the things that God has put into you and, and worked on your gifts, then you will serve before kings. In other words, you will have greater and greater and greater influence in the world. Listen, leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. When we live a life of integrity and a life of skill in the areas that He has given us, we have greater and greater influence. We become greater and greater leaders. Number three, you add value when you are using your gifts and talents to make a difference in the world. First Peter 4 says each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I love that he says that it's God's grace that you have been, that you are serving with. The gift, the talent, the intelligence, the intellect, the, 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 the things that you have, the personality, whatever it is that is in you that God has given to you, understand that it is grace given you so that you can give grace to others. You didn't just wake up when you were a day and a half year old and say, hey, I think I'm just going to be, you know, intelligent enough to be a doctor or intelligent enough to be a, a surgeon or, or intelligent enough to be a carpenter or a plumber or an electrician or a, a homemaker or a teacher or whatever. No, all of that is a gift that is given to you. And it's given to you so you can be a gift to others. So that the grace given you can be your gift of grace to others. And he says, use what you are gifted at. Use what you're good at. You see, a lot of times when we start talking about serving people, we think, oh, I just have to suffer, right? What we, what, the, the, old, the old thing, I guess if I'm going to really serve people, I'm going to have to go to Africa and be a missionary, Right? Only if that's what you're gifted at, because otherwise you're going to be terrible. You're going to do more damage than good. But if you will step into your giftedness, if you will step into what you're good at, not only will you be filled with joy and excitement and enthusiasm, you will fill the people around you because there's nothing greater than witnessing someone operating in their gifts. We pay entertainers huge amounts of money just so we can sit and watch them operate in their gift. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If God prepared work for you to do in advance, don't you think He prepared you to do that work in advance? He gave you what you have. He equipped you with what you need to be able to carry out what He has already prepared. Number four, you're adding value when you are willing to take responsibility. Listen to me. This is very important. I told Cody this is my favorite point because he said, you're going to yell it on this one, right? No, probably. Because I yell my favorite points. I'm going to talk quietly so you can understand what I'm saying. The moment that you walk into a room and see something wrong and say, that's not my problem, is the moment you just became useless. Did you get that? Or do I need to yell it? I can yell it. When you walk into a room and see a problem... If you have the ability to respond, then you have a responsibility to respond. Are you hearing me? Because you are not where you are with what you have by accident. You are where you are with what you have because God has put you there to respond with responsibility. 
to take responsibility for what is going on in front of you makes you valuable and adds value to the people around you. All right, enough said about that. Romans 12 is a great verse about it. Number five, you're adding value when you, when you are connecting with others, when you are connecting with and caring for others. Jesus demonstrated this for us perfectly. Everywhere Jesus went, He connected with people and He cared for their needs. He did what He needed to do for their, for, for their needs. He walked into a room and He took responsibility of whatever was happening there because He understood His value and He understood the value of others and He was willing to use what He had to serve others and to take responsibility for the problem that was at hand. And when He did, He connected and He cared for them and through that He added value to the people around him. Listen to this verse in Matthew 9. It says, Jesus went. That's probably enough right there. That's really all we need. What is, when is the last time you just went, right? You showed up. You were there to make a difference. One of the things I love about our church is the servant's heart that we, that, that, that we have that, we, that is demonstrated through the connection groups and through uh, people serving and going and making a difference and changing lives. That means that Jesus went because wherever we go, Jesus went there with us, right? Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When He saw the crowds, He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then He said to His disciples, that's us by the way, He says to His disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into the harvest field. That is us. That's who Jesus is telling us to ask for. To ask for those who will go and to make a difference and to add value to the people around them. Because that's how we matter. Number six, you're adding value when you are connecting with God for the benefit of other people. First Timothy 2 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all goodness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. He says, we have a responsibility to pray. We have a responsibility to come before the Lord, to come boldly into the throne room of grace where we receive our mercy and where we can give petition to the King. We get to communicate with God on a personal level, in a personal relationship. That is the greatest gift that any human could ever be given. And it is a great responsibility and a great opportunity and he says so when you do first of all i want you to come that petitions prayers intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people especially for kings and those who are in authority listen we spend a lot of time as americans we spend a whole lot of time effort and energy and even money so we can complain about the people who are in charge So we can gripe about the people that are in the government, the the people that have been elected. Listen, we elected them. We really shouldn't be. Anyway, don't complain about it. Nobody cares anyway. Pray. Pray for them. You are not, listen, we as Christians, we should make a rule for ourselves. I am not allowed to complain about anything that I have not yet first prayed for. I am not allowed to complain about another person, leader or not, 
until I have prayed for that person. Because I believe that when we pray for people, God changes our hearts and we don't even want to complain anymore. Number seven, you're adding value when you are letting the light of, and love of Christ shine through. Matthew 5, 14 says, you are the light of the world. He's talking about you. Those of us, those of you who have Christ in your heart, who are Christians, who are believers, followers of Christ, you are the light of the world. We have the light in us because we have Christ in us. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people let a lamp, uh, light a lamp and put it under a bowl, under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When you are valuing yourself and valuing others and pouring out yourself and taking responsibility and operating in your gifts and doing what God has put into you and pouring it out as the grace that it is for the sake of others and praying and connecting with people and caring for them and connecting with God on their behalf and then and then plugging into the the light, the source of power that God has given us through the Holy Spirit. Listen, you You are adding value. You are making a difference. You are changing the world. That is why the church is here. We are here to bring the value of God from heaven to earth. We are the connectors. We are the ones who are connected with the Most High God through the Holy Spirit. We have the connection where we can flow His grace to us and through us to all the people around. And that is how we make a difference. And that is how we add value. And that is how we get to the next level of you. Right? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for these insights, for these reminders from Your Word, for these thoughts that hopefully challenge us to rise up and become what You want us to be. To help us to understand, Lord, what You want us to accomplish in this life. You have put us here for such a time as this. That You have given us what we have in the the resources, the gifts, the abilities, and the opportunities so that we can indeed make a difference. So that we can indeed add value to the people around us. So that we can up-level the value that we bring. Because Lord, we do it to glorify You. So that others may see our good deeds and glorify You in heaven. Our Father who makes it all possible. So Lord, let us always give You the honor, the glory, the recognition, the gratefulness for all that You have done and all that You're doing. In Jesus' name, Amen.